but I would like to uh, welcome everyone and introduce you all for those of you who have not met um, Sune, the assistant curator at the TAM. She is going to tell us a little bit today about uh, what's happened, what's been happening, what's going to be happening, all that great stuff uh, that's happening at the TAM while we have not been able to be inside. So for us, because it's just the membership today, um, I'm going to go ahead and keep our um, keep the gallery view and then when Sune needs to share her screen uh, we'll pop off gallery view for a little bit. Chat's open I'll throw a few links in there if we need to but take it away Sune. All right hi everybody hi. I'm gonna apologize right off I've got kind of a weird setup in here so I'm gonna try to be really good about looking at the camera, but it's well below my computer. So I'm just gonna apologize right now if I'm kind of looking off to the side. Um, I'm the assistant curator here at Torrance Art Museum. I've been here for a little under two years now. It's already been quite a while, uh, surprisingly, especially since the last year is a little bit of a blur. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I have a degree is in art history and in curatorial studies from UC Santa Barbara and the University of Essex, um, which is in the UK. And uh, for the past 10 plus years, I've been working in and around LA at various um, art institutions and nonprofits. Most recently, I was at the Institute of Cultural Inquiry, which is a nonprofit over in Culver City. Unfortunately, um, they closed about a year ago because their, their founder uh, unfortunately died, which was a little bit tragic, but I've definitely been around. I know today um, we're, Janine wanted to go a little bit into the curatorial process and like how we go into shows and form them at TAM. Um, they all start pretty much with a concept. Um, in this case, um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about Zoo, which was the planned show for January, which hasn't been mounted yet. Um, that's still kind of in limbo. It's probably not going to be mounted um, because I don't think we'll get clearance before uh, summer rolls around. Um, but it's still kind of hanging out on deck. In this case, Zoo is an exhibition about animals. So that's such an expansive range of art. Um, animals are super, super common um, topic and figure throughout pretty much all of art, I'm going to say, except for abstraction, maybe. Um, so in this particular case, we're starting with a list of literally hundreds of artists, which is a lot larger than we normally start with, um, because there's just so many artists that fit into this particular category. And then from there, as we do research into exactly what kinds of art um, each of these artists are making, be it sculpture, what kind of forms they have, what have you. And we gain images and try to find out where the artists are based, um, if it would be feasible to bring these works in. You gradually cull the list down. Um, right now, in terms of um, budgets and things like that, TAM is a little bit limited. So about 90 to 95% of our work, I would say, is being sourced directly from the greater Los Angeles area um, because that's what's the easiest to bring in. So that calls down the list a little bit as well. Um, if an artist is too far away, how do we decide on the th what themes to address? Max, do you mean in a specific exhibition or the exhibition itself? Oh, uh, in terms of <laughs> in terms of zoo, um, it kind of goes both ways. Um, obviously, the overarching element is animals, but based on which artists or which works start to become appealing, um, I think a lot of themes naturally arise in the work. You start to see a lot of connections in the things that you're already picking out. Um, in the case of much of the work that did get picked for Zoo, a lot of it ended up revolving around ideas of environmentalism. So the ways um, humans have kind of encroached on the environment, extinction, um, and also the kind of blurry lines between human and animal, all kind of coming together in those various ways. Humans are also animals, so how and where do we draw those lines? 
Um, and again, those the, in this case, those themes kind of naturally emerged. Um, they tend to be a little bit more precise when the starting topic is more uh, specific, I guess I would say, like in, for example, Deaf Cult, which we did last year, um, started with much more specific themes. We had to find a lot more specificity in the works themselves. And then you still get the themes from arise from that, from motorcycle culture and things like that. But a lot of times, um, at least for me, a lot of the themes become more clear as we pick the art, um, if that makes sense. Sorry, that went on a little bit of a tangent. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and show you my screen a little bit. I've just kind of called a selection of about five or six artists that were picked for this exhibition and showing you some of the work, um, either that is meant to be on display or to give you an idea of what kind of work they do do. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you that. Um, there you go, perfect. Yeah. Um, so this is one of the largest works um, for Zoo. This is an artist out of Long Beach, Lori Lamont. Um, she's a self-taught artist. Uh, this is actually a very large scale watercolor. Most people aren't doing watercolors quite on this size. Um, this is 51 by about 240 inches combined, uh, which is massive. It would take up an entire wall of the, the gallery. Um, since we're looking at about 24 feet long there. Um, here we're seeing some of the themes I was talking about before, that kind of human impact on animals. We have obviously a selection of deer who've all been branded in kind of the same way you would brand NASCAR or something like that. Um, in this case, advertising has just kind of gone rogue <laughs> and has even expanded to the natural life. Um, again, where are we drawing those lines? What kind of impact are we having on animals? Could we have on animals? Obviously it's sort of fantastical, um, but it's still bringing through that same point of, sorry, there's something outside, um, of impacts humans are having on that natural environment. Um, I personally really like her work, I feel like it's very vibrant. And again, she's local, which is nice. Um, her studio is right near um, Long Beach Museum of Art for anyone who's familiar with their campus as well. I can't see the chat anymore. So if anyone has a specific question. Um, well, I was gonna say just that literal idea of branding, you know, like yeah. when we think about an animal being branded with the but particularly in Colorado, it's a very popular thing. There's lots of wildlife yeah. um, on, you know, ranches and things like that. So this is just, you know, taking it to a very literal. Thing. Yeah, this, I guess you could also go into branding in that form is obviously about ownership. And I guess in this sense, you, you would also have a bit of ownership from all of these brands, other type of brand who are imprinting themselves onto the animals. Um, so it's an interesting approach there as well. Um, this is another artist, uh, Cara Maria. She's based out of San Francisco. Um, again, what I was saying before in terms of limitations for what we can source, um, because she is outside of the Los Angeles area and for many of the artists, other artists we source as well, a lot of them based around the country, um, the main source would be to try to find either galleries or collectors who own or ex exhibit their work where we can source them from. In this case, we were lucky in that the artist had a collector in West Hollywood who was able to loan us something. So the image on the left, uh, Mayday Tarsier, um, is meant to be in zoo, and that would be coming from a private collection. Uh, Car Maria's work largely deals with extinction so they're all like this, where you have these very pop, graphic, colorful backgrounds and then miniature portraits of endangered species. Um, and that's kind of speaking to um, rates of extinction and how these things are maybe not always paid attention to. Obviously the first thing you see are these wild colors, very, very pretty, 
um, but the animal is in there too and it's slowly disappearing. Uh, all of the animals in her work are um, slowly dying out. So in this case, Tarsier and then the other one, which wasn't available, has a, a pangolin in it. Um, she's got a massive series of work all featuring different animals uh, in that way. This is Zachary Drucker and Luke Guilford. This is taking kind of the opposite approach. A lot of the works um, in general kind of are blurring animals back into the human world. This is blurring a human sort of backwards into the animal world in a sense, um, because the artist has transformed themselves with this mass of fur. Zachary Drucker is a trans artist. Um, so the, we have the title of the work, this is what it looks like to go from one thing to everything. And we can kind of read into it how we like in a sense, but it's again, sort of blurring that line between um, human and animal, but also sort of this beauty element, this mysteriousness. Um, this is a photo series they did obviously several years ago. Um, so taking kind of opposite themes as well to show different approaches to the same thing. So it can be as expansive as possible um, without going too far left field. I do think the, the image on the right in particular is a very beautiful image. Um, so moving into Cynthia Monet, these are not the works that would be on display, but Cynthia Monet is meant to be in this exhibition. Um, her work deals a lot with environmentalism and extinction as well. Um, the works we're seeing here are made all of um, kind of salvaged plastics that have been found around Los Angeles. She repurposes them into um, these light-based sculptures. We're not getting a close-up here, but if you were seeing it, a lot of these plastics are things like milk jugs and things like that um, that originate as litter. Um, again, human impact on the environment and how we're affecting them, that kind of ecological degradation. Um, for Zoo, um, Cynthia was actually making a new work, um, which was going to be a large scale inflatable uh, rhinoceros. It would have lights embedded into it as well that would have gone into the dark room. Um, hopefully we can still get that in at some point, um, but that one is meant to, um, be interactive, the lights in it gradually turn off at the rate of extinction for um, that particular breed of rhinoceros and it's um, full scale. So it is life size. Uh, this is sort of a fascinating approach to, to doing that a visual um, and also interactive element. So going into some other themes, this is Catherine Cohn. This is from her Canary Suicide series, it's a little dark. Um, the image in the upper left corner is, is the work and then I've provided some, some close-up details. The work itself is not very large, but she throws a ton of details into all of the works in this series. Um, in this particular case, we're looking at themes of captivity. Um, the kind of ideas we keep about pets, but also we've humanized the canary quite a bit. Um, in this particular scene, the canary is sort of a Hollywood starlet um, and they're all different. She's done quite a few of these in the series, um, all with different themes. And, and in all of them, the canaries have committed suicide from no longer wanting to be in captivity. Um, you can see kind of in this upper right, this particular canary has overdosed. Um, but all of the canaries in this series all feature um, a suicide note and a pet of their own. Again, how humans impact animals in this way. Um, obviously, tons of people, myself included, do have pets, but there's that idea of captivity, not just with pets, but with zoo animals as well, how they're treated. And in this case, also ideas of anthropomorph, I can't say that right now, anthropomorphization. Yeah, of um, projecting human characteristics onto animals as well. Is that like a spilled bottle of 
hills or something. I can't it really is, guess. Yeah, yeah, kind of insinuating that it's the canary has overdosed. Um, it is a taxidermy canary in a vintage cage. All of her um, birds are sourced ethically. None of them have been killed for this purpose or anything like that. Max put in the chat, uh, canary and a coal mine. Canary and a coal mine connection as well. Yes, of course. Yeah, that as well. They're all canaries. Um, and you can, in that perspective of canary and a coal mine, you can kind of read into that as well. In this particular case, maybe the ills of society. Um, that it's a harbinger of that as well. You can kind of see, I don't know how well you can see some of these small images, um, but in that the sort of center one, the canary has the, the latest issue of the tabloids. And I, one I, I wasn't able to fit on there. They're kind of showing this, again, the title is ready for my close up. They had kind of a checklist of all the things they'd been preparing for themselves, spray tan, lipo, fillers, to try to make themselves as beautiful as possible. And then they just clearly couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> so we can obviously look at it from that perspective as well. There are different ones. Um, another one that I'm not showing here just because I didn't want to clutter up the slide too much. Um, it's called grenade. So they're all in these vintage cages like this, but in that one, the canary has blown themselves up. So it's just an explosion of feathers surrounding the cage. Um, again, sort of harbinger for not being able to take it anymore or things like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Moving into another artist this is E.E. E. Kono. She's local. Um, this artist is based out of Palos Verdes. Mm -hmm. Her work is egg tempura, which is a super old fashioned medium. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, it's natural pigment blended with egg yolk. It requires you to work very quickly and precisely in a ton of layers. I think each of these has hundreds and hundreds of layers on them, which is part of why they're so small. If you can see the ones on the left and right are both only about eight by 10 inches. They're very, very little. Um, but that is in part because of the medium she's working with. She takes a lot of her... Um, inspiration from Renaissance art and the idea that we're kind of in our own Renaissance in a way, because in the Renaissance, of course, we gained a lot of information about culture, art, and expanded quite a bit. And right now we're in that sort of same place where technology has expanded hugely over the last hundred years and society has changed quite a bit from it. So we've gone kind of a fantastical route here. Um, Obviously these are more mythical sort of made up creatures. We are seeing, if you can kind of tell in the background, um, you can tell how local she is. We're seeing a background of downtown Olay and the one in the left, if you look in that lower right or lower left corner. And then we're kind of seeing across Santa Monica Bay in the center one as well. Um, so I do think she's taking some inspiration from her local surroundings in addition to these, these fantastic beasts. Um, sort of drawing to that sort of mysticism as well. Um, we're getting those, a lot of tattoo culture. Uh, yes. Are those bees uh, in the center uh, hovering above the entwined? Um, it is, yes, that's forms. a bee right yeah, in the center. Be I think there's like a whole, there's a whole thing about bees and bees in art and royalty art and some of that you were saying. Um, yeah. I think the Fleur de Lis was originally actually originally a bee as well, or at least some people ah. speculate that. Uh, people don't agree on that, but there is um, a lot of consensus that the Fleur de Lis might have originally been a bee as well. And that it's the same, there's a bee hovering yeah. right in the center of the I yellow one. Um, so yeah, great. Is, kind of, is that a dirigible he's there sitting on and holding? I First, think I thought it was a surfboard, but I think it's a dirigible. I think it's a, a submarine a, of some oh, a sort. Submarine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I can't. I can't say precise. I think it's kind of the same right here as well. Yeah. Um, that this this bull creature is holding. So yeah, in this case, again, we've gone a more fantastical route. Yeah, it's very whimsical. This is sort of my last slide. This is um, Josie Morway. I think she's currently based in New York, but luckily Corey Helford Gallery in Los Angeles holds quite a bit of her work and they're able to, to loan us some pieces. Again, we're kind of blurring the line into the fantastical here I, and between plants and animals. Um, her personal reasoning between 
behind a lot of her art is to create this kind of fantasticism, um, highlighting how no matter how much we study animals, we'll never really know them completely in their hows and whys, and creating, again, that sense of awe and wonder, but also the human hand in the animals. Um, we're seeing them quite small here, but a lot of them in person are hyper-realistic. So the feathers are very, very highly detailed. Most of her works do contain birds, um, although we get quite a few others like um, the gleaner here as well with horned animals. So yeah, that's kind of just a selection. Obviously there's several other artists who are in the show. This is only just a kind of skim off the top to give you sort of an idea of the things that would be in the show and some of the themes that are being covered as well. Um, again, I know Janine, we were talking earlier um, in terms of going behind the scenes, maybe a little bit of how things are done and how they work. Um, again, in selecting the work, there are sort of limitations. <laughs> we were taught, Janine and I were talking a little bit about this before everyone joins in and how a lot of the average museum goer may not necessarily know or ever think about how things come into the museum or any museum. For us personally, um, I already talked a little bit about proximity. Um, size is also going to play a huge part whether or not we can feasibly move it. I know with Cynthia Manet's work um, coming back over here, that was a problem. She originally wanted to show a work called Pantera Atrox, which is a huge uh, mechanical panther that she showed at Croft Contemporary about a year or two ago. Um, but it just wasn't possible. The work is about 400 pounds. Oh. And uh, about, I want to say 11 feet long, so it's just far beyond, um, might have even been 12, what we're physically able to transport without having to hire outside movers, okay. um, have a crane or things like that. Um, and that does happen. Um, you find this amazing work and then you think, oh my gosh, it's six inches bigger than what I can put in the van. <laughs> or what have you, and then you have to kind of go back to the drawing board and see what's available, um, what else might I be able to take from that artist instead. So things like that definitely happen. Yeah, because I know we've had some, there's been some really large pieces um, there have. that have been brought in, but so the idea there is that you would need to hire someone to bring them in. Um, like, would they come in, do they come in the back or how do you get those large pieces in? Luckily for us, um, we're a single story museum, so we don't have to worry about the limitation of how big a service elevator is. And the back doors to the gallery, the ones that lead out to the courtyard are extremely tall, which helps as well. Um, okay. So a lot of the larger works do come in through that back gate. Um, in terms of something like uh, the Liz Craft, which obviously was very large and very heavy, we did have to hire a professional mover for that. And sometimes that comes down to budget. Again, uh, how does something get into the museum? Uh, max size is going to play a big um, role in that because if it's bigger than the door, it's not coming in ever. <laughs> sure. Okay, that makes sense. That makes uh, sense. It's just not going to happen unless it comes in in multiple pieces, but then it would have to be reassembled. And that's not all works are can be disassembled anyways. Obviously with a bronze, it can't be disassembled. Those are kind of limitations on how we choose things in that way. Um, stuff we do have to consider how big it is. If we have the money uh, available to perhaps hire private transport, we try not to do that very often because we are on quite a limited budget. Um, so most of what we source does need to be small enough to fit in the TAM van. The museum has a dedicated art transport van that we use for those things um, to bring everything in for us. Again, mostly coming from around LA. Every now and then we go a little bit further out to um, perhaps Palm Desert or San Diego or Santa Barbara, but we try not to go too far. Um, and, and then as far as the, and this is where folks can definitely begin to unmute and um, feel free to ask, we, some stuff's popping up in the chat, but feel free to ask uh, your questions at this point. Um, mine would be just how, 
how when you select an artist um what is that selection process do you reach out to them do you put out a call and then when they do reply do you uh specify the work the individual work that you want to have shown are you looking for a specific piece or is there just a specific um or, or just a general uh representation of their work so it depends um almost exclusively we are reaching out to a specific artist we don't off since i've been here i don't think we've done any just pure open calls i could be wrong about that but i don't think we have generally we contact the artists we're interested in after we've gone through our list and done a lot of research and kind of culled it down to the artists we feel best represent the theme and are going to go well together visually um in terms of whether we're choosing a specific work or not it depends on the artist um in the case of several of the artists we just clicked through now their work tends to be very similar um they work in a specific style and any available work from that style is probably going to fit what we're looking for so we approach the artist um with the exhibition um theme and dates um see if they're interested and then ask for a list of what's available and then from there we see um oh yeah these works would fit great in the show or sometimes in the more unfortunate route oh everything that's available doesn't fit what i was looking for um so we may not be able to go with this artist anymore because that does happen as well maybe what uh we thought we were interested is from an older collection those works aren't available anymore or they just work in a completely different style now and they've moved away from that so you're not really going to be able to get what you thought you were looking for um other times you we are looking for a specific work um if there's only maybe one or two works um from an artist that fit the theme but all the rest of their work is very different um then we are approaching them asking if that very specific work is available because the bulk of their other work just wouldn't fit the theme. So it goes both ways on that one. So from the chat, um, what are you looking for in making your selections aside from that, uh, those logistics? Um, how well it fits the theme, if it is going to visually connect with the other works that are going to be on display. Um, it would be very odd to have, I mean, we work with contemporary art at TAM, but just in a general sense, um, depending on what the exhibition is, it might be odd to have, you know, 90% contemporary and then run one Renaissance work unless it connected super well. Um, so you do want them to, at least in, for me, I do want them to um, visually look nice together as well and also how they fit the theme. So again, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of works with dogs in them, but not all of those works are going to fit kind of the themes that are already calling for this exhibition. Um, some of them is literally just a picture of a dog. It's not necessarily saying anything, um, which is fine, but it's not what we're doing for this exhibition. Okay, so everybody else, do you guys have any questions at all for Sune about the curatorial process before we kind of talk about what's been happening at TAM? You guys are so quiet. We are <laughs> gonna have to, we're gonna have to have a raffle or something to get, I don't know, some kind of a something to get everybody participating. Um, Max threw a question into the chat. Uh, what's your first, what, are your personal favorite artists and how does that influence your selections and do you like I always wonder that too like from a cure from a curator's perspective are there certain kinds of works that you gravitate to and more so are there certain kinds of works away from which you gravitate that you you know a way that you wouldn't look at and ever consider and following on that have you ever been anywhere where you've seen one piece and I was just so blown away by it that you think you could create a whole show of either just that one artist or a whole show of similar work? That was a lot of questions rolled into yeah, one. Yeah, it was. I'm so <laughs> sorry. You just answer whichever one you remember or want to. Um, no, obviously, any. I think that's true of everyone. Your personal aesthetic is going to influence your choices a lot. 
for me, I think even just from what I've shown you, I think, um, I don't know if it's obvious or not, but I personally am drawn to very bright, vibrant work. Um, I like a lot of color um, and that does influence a lot of my choices um, there versus um, some curators. I think Max especially likes a lot of darker, maybe a little more gritty work. Um, and that's a personal preference. Um, I'm just immediately drawn to, to things with those kind of impact. Those, that being said, uh, I do like a lot of the, the darker themes as well. Um, my personal favorite artists. I mean, I actually, I know he's a little overblown. I really love Murakami. I think a lot of his older work is really fascinating um, in talking about um, kind of the differences between traditional Japanese art and Western art and how to cross that bridge and be successful. A lot of his very early work was heavily about that. So using the Asian influence, but pop culture or uh, pop colors um, and what he deemed super flat, um, his sort of painting technique um, to highlight those themes. Also the otaku or kind of anime culture. Um, he was a lot more political in the beginning. I feel like now it's a, a lot more of the happy flowers and that's what he's more known for. Um, but I really find some of the impetus behind his original work super interesting. I have a, a strong passion for Asian art. I also have a degree in Asian studies. Um, so I like a lot of the Asian pop art or um, sorry, modern art as well, not necessarily just pop. Um, not as much the traditional art because it's just not what I'm as much drawn to. Um, but I do like a lot of modern um, and contemporary Asian art as well. What was the I other question? Oh, uh, what is your favorite artist? And oh, have you ever seen a have you ever seen a show or been anywhere, public art, whatever, where the piece is just so makes such an impact on you that you think as a curator, I could I could actually do a whole show about this either this theme or this one piece of work that I see somewhere. Oh, absolutely. I think that definitely happens where you see something um, that just kind of blows you away. I've never seen this before. This is such a fascinating approach. I don't have an example off the top of my head right now, but that has absolutely happened to me where um, your mind automatically just starts reeling. Where could I run with this thing? Um, what other people are doing something similar to this um, thematically or visually? Um, and how can I kind of disseminate this and put my own spin on it? That, 100% happens. I think one of the um, shows that's in development for TAM for maybe next year, um, I have a feel, I mean, Max can chime in on that as own, but I'm pretty sure that's how that, one of the ones on deck for next year generated, because um, it's coming off perhaps a single artist right now and is going to launch into other artists um, working on a theme. So absolutely that happens. Well, that's kind of how we wanted to uh, finish up this session. It may be a bit shorter than some of our others, but mostly we were just, we, I think the majority of folks who have tuned in today recognize that the TAM has uh, definitely, and I, I keep saying I'm not going to use the word, but have made the switch instead of the P word, uh, have made the switch to a much more virtual interactive kind of um, approach to work, having it be on uh, view, as it were, vir virtually through the website and through their Instagram account. They are they're on social media. Jason's been doing a lot with that. Um, but but maybe just talking a little bit about, um, you know, you said you had a staff meeting today. So how how has the staff been reacting to the fact that the museum number one has had to be closed for so long? Just that monumental task of having to cancel shows and. How do you deal with all of that? As optimistically as possible. <laughs> yeah, that's a good response. Yes. Yeah, um, you're right. I feel like, you know, we've been in this for quite a while now. Um, we're, what, about a year into the pandemic since everything closed. Um, probably just under that for Los Angeles. So I think we probably closed around mid-month last year, which coincidentally just happened to be when Death Cult was closing anyways. Um, and obviously when that first happened, no one knew um, how long this was gonna last, at least not in real terms. Um, we, the way we plan exhibitions, um, they start 
probably at least a minimum of one year in advance. So everything for 2020 was already on deck for the calendar year. Um, we just kept going. Uh, we've already been planning these things. Um, and again, with that sense of optimism of just keep going in the hopes that you can, because if you stop, that takes away the ability to do it later um, sure. because of all the logistics um, involved in planning exhibitions. You can't bring one together, at least not necessarily what we're doing. You can do a pop-up installation, but in terms of what we're doing, you can't really throw one together on a dime um, and turn it around in just a couple of weeks. So we really just kept going with the, the 2020 calendar um, in the hopes that we would be able to open and show them to, to everyone. We did mount um, the summer exhibition last year and the fall exhibition, Baker's Dozen and Semblance Sunshine in the hopes that we would be able to open to the public. Luckily, we were at least able to document them and put that all online. Um, it was a shame no one got to physically see them, but we remained hopeful the whole time. And I think we're doing that now as well. We're remaining hopeful and planning the calendar for the year out in the hopes that we're gonna get people back in. And that's that's all you really can do, you know? Uh, sure. It's almost the, the opposite of uh, plan for the worst, hope for the best. We're like planning for the best and then <laughs> the backup plan for the worst. Sure, the law of attraction works uh, very well in that regard, right? If that's what yeah. you're that's what you're focusing on then the probability of it happening is a little bit higher yeah. Um, yeah. but in the meantime we've been doing trying to put out as much virtual content as possible you know we've done the Hobson's Choice staff picks hope has a recurring segment on don't touch the art which is ways of um, exploring and engaging with art uh, virtually and just trying to keep people as engaged as possible until we are able to open those doors again so do you want to talk a little bit about the public art uh, plan in the next, I guess maybe the summer, or maybe it's now going to be the fall, or maybe it will be the summer. Tell us a little bit about what you know about Ultra. Uh, how much are we going into that, Max? <laughs> um, as much as you want. Yeah. yeah so that's still that's okay. Well, it's still very much in the works. Um, we're in the early logistics phase for that. Hopefully. Everything comes together and coalesces nicely, but Tam is currently planning a public art exhibition for this summer um, entitled Ultra. So the basic plan is to install um, works around Torrance in public parks, empty storefronts, um, and other sort of empty space that we might be able to take over for a couple months so that people can go all around the city and be able to see it. Again, kind of a way of engaging people while still having that knowledge that maybe we can't get them into the museum that early as the summer. So how can we get people to be able to see art without necessarily having to let them into our building? Um, and this is a great way of doing that. I think it's gonna be super positive and interesting way to get people, not only who the local community exploring town a little bit more, but people from the surrounding communities to visit Torrance, um, and come see see the art. I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, I think it's gonna be a great show. Um, we've got a lot of really interesting artists. Some of it's already um, started to come together. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows Fallen Fruit, but they've, um, I think, was that tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow um, they're planting the trees for a public fruit park in Torrance and that'll be part of Ultra as well. So that's exciting. Um, all the trees are, are being planted tomorrow and then the plaques and everything will go in closer to summer and that's going into Lago Seco Park so that'll be great and then there's several sculptures and some video installations that are going to be going up as well um, yeah I'm very excited about that project but it's still coming together so we're we're figuring it out I don't know if Torrance has um, any public art I can't remember. It, well, I haven't lived there in, since 2016, so I'm not sure what's gone up since then, but I don't, other than maybe what's in City Hall, I, I can't remember a lot of public art in Torrance. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. It doesn't have a ton, um, which is a shame. Public art is great. <laughs> um, these are all going to be temporary. They're not permanent installations, so they'll go up from about July through mid-September. 
Oh, and except for be... one. There is going to be one that's permanent. Um, there's a mural going up onto the side of our building, and that's by uh, Jan van der Blue. So that'll happen, I think, in June, maybe July. Um, it's it's yeah. going to get done in June. It starts in June to make sure it's ready for the opening on July 17th. Yeah. And of course, the uh, fallen fruit will be permanent. Yeah. So the fallen fruit and the Jan van der Poel will both be permanent and everything else will be temporary. Um, but it should be really good and engaging. There's a really exciting roster of artists on deck. So um, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of good work as long as everything comes together nicely. Susan's saying that um, there's a sculpture at Columbia Park at the corner of Prairie and 190th. Kind of up the street from you guys, maybe. Yeah. Prairie. I'm forgetting how the streets go, but um, well, that's great. And so this will be separate then, interestingly enough, this will be separate um, from the Cultural Arts Commission that the city actually has. And so they not they haven't done I know that in Colorado the city that the town that we just came from had a um, small but very active cultural arts commission who commissioned all of the public art that is in the city of Lone Tree and it's it's extensive there's a lot there's probably 50 pieces and there's a, a guide that they have online that you can you know follow around, along and most all of the public buildings so all the libraries um, the art center um, the, the all sorts of different public buildings have public art at them. Sometimes the art center has several pieces at it outside. So they have to be hardy. <laughs> Let yeah. us know. Torps does also have an arts commission because um, I know that had the, the mural and the translation had to be approved um, because those are permanent. Um, and I know Los Angeles has kind of built that into their building code in the past few years. I know new construction does have to include uh, public art if it's over a certain size, um, which is interesting. So there's a lot more public art that's gone into greater Los Angeles as well. But I'm not as familiar ex with exactly how the Torrance Arts Commission runs um, in terms of what their regulations are. Okay. Um, just trying to think before we, before before we close, um, anything else you want to add about either what's happening or what you see happening, what shows you, you have you, so then do you pretty much have all of 2020, where are we now, March, 2021? So do you have through March, 2022 kind of planned out? We have a tentative plan through, I think, December, 2022 or January, 2023. Oh, nice. um, which is typical. We tend to plan the calendars a couple years out. Um, some of that may have to be shifted around based on how the next few months go. I know um, studio systems, which was supposed to happen last year, um, has been pushed again because we're still not open. And the same with CoLab, which has been pushed back to next year instead of um, spring um, now-ish when it would have run. And so what goes into deciding uh, that th some, some shows will be virtual and some shows will just simply be canceled? Oh, I think Max is probably better uh, posed to answer that question, but I think it comes down to space limitations and time limitations in terms of what's on the calendar and what can or can't be moved. Um, so like for collab, for instance, you know, how difficult would it be to do a to do a co to do collab five as a as a virtual uh, pairing uh, rather than not rather than, but if you cannot bring it in, um, it, is it possible to do it or do, is everything just lost in in doing it in an image? Max, if you have better input on that, I think it would be extremely difficult just because it's you're already coordinating people around the world to sort of work together. I don't know if it's as effective if they're not able to physically work together in some capacity. We're doing an online intro this year mm -hmm. to some of the spaces because they can't do it this year uh, physically. But the whole purpose of CoLab was to bring people together physically. Right. So that they could meet, work together, um, in the hopes that they would go on post-museum experience to work together and extend international contacts. 
that's the whole purpose of it. Um, and so um, when we re realize we can't have some people taking part because of COVID, there's no point in doing it. I mean, it needs to be put off until people can come and interact one-on-one -on -one in real life. Um, uh, you know, unlike some other exhibitions, the purposes of CoLab is not just the exhibition, but the extension that it has into future events and collaborations. Yeah. And, and was there not a forum this year? And will there be a forum uh, ever again? Yeah, question mark. We'll see. Uh, okay. There was not a forum this last year. Um, but yeah, we'll see if that continues in the future or not. Um, I think that's still up in there. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you taking the time out. Um, that would have been an extraordinary show to see uh, Zoo. And uh, hopefully, I know you said you have till almost 2023 out there, but it would be great if you could somehow work it back into the rotation because it looked extraordinary, really. Those yeah, pieces that you have up there now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, next. So uh, this, might, go ahead, Max. I think it might be possible that we kind of distill that show down because we've had to shift things from last year and this year to next year and the year after. Yeah. Um, that we look at this in terms of distilling this because there's some great art in the lineup is to distill it down and perhaps uh, take it into the gallery too um, because we have more openings um, sure. in the gallery too because we leave it open um, because some of this would be, I mean, it needs to be seen um, it's just that now this whole thing has shunted up all of the opportunities with those recurring shows like Studio System, CoLab, etc. Um, I think what we'll, we'll need to do is probably address like a, a real core grouping like she's shown us today because it's fantastic and then do an exhibition in Gallery 2 to make up for that. Yeah. Yeah. Is the hallway piece still up? Yes. Yes, it is. It, um, it is. still there. Is it is that going to pretty much be, is it painted? I have not seen it in person. Is it painted on the wall? Yeah, it's, it's made tape. of tape. Okay. It's permanent. It is, okay, great. Well, um, we hope that you can, uh, I know some folks have already signed up. We hope that you can join us uh, next week when um, on Friday, we'll go back to Fridays, uh, when Leslie, she's gonna wave, is going to be, um, yeah is going to be walking us through a, a, what's going to be a fascinating look at the work of um, artist Alan Gallagher. Do you wanna give us a little sneak peek about what's gonna come up next week? Um, sure. Um, well, she is, this would be something good to discuss ahead of time too. She's a multidisciplinary artist and I, started uh, watching her on the Art 21 and keeping track maybe 15 years ago now. Um, I'm in awe of her talent. She started out in carpentry. And so she, in the first Art 21 I watched, I was even, I, I'm an art geek so I, and a nerd. So I was fascinated that she's building her own lattice because of her carpentry skills so that she could sit on top of this huge canvas over a lattice on the floor and glue down children's penmanship paper like a skin to paint over. So, and her first works were, um, she goes back to that theme on race. She's using uh, minstrel eyes and mouths in a repetition. And I'm sorry I missed the Basquiat. I, I had something else going on, but I was I started thinking after reading Max's um, piece on him, wonderful piece, that uh, you know you could kind of reach back and there's there's kind of elements of graffiti, but yet there's um, collage and rep definitely repetition and revision that even makes me think of well revisionist history. Um, and then um, she has themes of, I don't have my notes here, right? <laughs> I didn't oh, know no, I, you're fine. That's fine. We were uh, just, we were just it, looking for a little. Afrofuturism with, here's old school notes <laughs> on, on um, while I'm doing it. Dr there's something, I don't know if anyone's heard of this. I hadn't before, honestly. I plead complete ignorance. Um, Drexia, 
So there was a techno group in the 90s, Drexia, and they it, it's almost like Marvel Comics on steroids where um, there's an underwater land where pregnant African-American women were cast off the boats and then they morphed into something else. Well, I had no idea until starting to prep for next week that, that what, that's a huge influence on her work. And now I can really see that because her work um, always references water also, even though it's abstracted. She's um, an amazing, I, I think, an amazing craftsman, I mean, technically. And she also works with animation. And I, I, I love that she animated cut paper collage in um, her, I don't know if they're married, um, her mates. Um, I'm trying to find more recent history on her. Um, she lives part-time in Rotterdam. One of her studios is in Rotterdam, the other one's in New York. And he works in animation, so they do collabs together. And I, I find that fascinating. I find her, um, she's very intellectual. So I love listening to her talk. Her interviews are always like straightforward and just very well explained a lot better than what I can have oh. coming out at the moment. I try no. to, um, I get stuck on words a lot sometimes, but um well, that's and great. We are that you asked me to do this because um, when you said, "Do you have any artists that you'd be interested in these group?" and Thanks, I just Matt. popped off. <laughs> well, good. No, that's perfect, and we're just so pleased that you stepped up. Um, Sam is going to be doing the one at the end of the month, and so we're just really, really thrilled. That's going to be on um, the San Francisco figurist. I'm not sure I'm even saying that figurative art in San Francisco, no. Um, and that's coming up soon too at the end of the month. And so uh, Jason has reached out, Jason Jen at the museum has reached out and said that he is going to be um, willing to talk with us in April. And so that will be great. Um, so we're hoping to continue these as far as, far as we can. Uh, if you have other art artists that you'd like, or if you chat with other TAMA members who are interested in either presenting and or uh, hearing more about different artists, we're happy to take any suggestions and fly with them. So as, uh, as Leslie was saying, uh, like for James Terrell, some of the work, you know, some of the things, I, some of the artists I had just never heard of, and even the ones I had heard of, I didn't know a lot of their backstory. So a lot goes in. You, she was talking about um, stumbling down a rabbit hole, and I can totally relate to that because, you know, you especially on something where there's a lot of hyperlinks, man, you just start clicking, and the next thing you know, you're you're five hours deep into, you know, Basquiat's heroin dealer. So um, I have I, a question, if that's yeah. okay, on um, for Sue. Um, I've been trying to figure out the difference between interdisciplinary versus um, multimedia. Mm -hmm. So is multimedia means it has to have like video arts because she's like both. So multimedia does not need to have any sort of video or digital component, but it does need to use um, a lot of different materials at once. Um, for example, oil, pencil, enamel, spray paint, or even in sort of like your assemblages, if it had newspaper and recycled materials and whatever thrown in. It's okay. literally just a lot of different stuff together versus interdisciplinary is someone who is a painter and also a video artist. Okay. So it's mixed media and multimedia then you could use as the same? Uh, no, mixed media is what I was describing. Multimedia would be a use of different video channels and things like that technology. And, and then interdisciplinary is that you're doing more than one thing. So that yeah, would- So like you're a sculptor and a painter. 
Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, but I was oh no <laughs> different things on that, and I thought, well, let me talk to somebody that talks about that all the time. You know, yeah, I hadn't really considered that, but yeah, those are all very similar terms. They're different connotations. Yeah. Thank you. I hope Sam, I didn't talk too much, by the way. <laughs> no, you're fine. Don't worry, Sam. You're good for Friday. Any questions? Anything you want to let us know about? Not the the twenty sixth. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, yeah, I, is it possible to have Ann Weber involved in the? Yes, so I sent Ann a note, uh, I sent her an email, and I got a note back from her that said, yes, please send me the time and day. So Great. now that we, we identified yeah. you, um, now that we did that, we'll, I'll go ahead and send her the Zoom link, and yeah. uh, I'll start to prepare those slides for you. Um, I ran all of the artists that you recommended by Max, uh, so that he's aware too. And I'm not sure if he, I don't think he threw anybody in, nor did he throw anybody out. So, um, <laughs> I'll go ahead That's and do good. as much. Yeah, yeah. I'll do as much research on those folks and give them each a slide or slides, depending on how much work there is, but it'll be similar to this. It'll run about an hour, um, <laughs> maybe 45 minutes to an hour so we can take questions and Go That's from there. Good. Yeah, and if we're well, going to have a little. Uh, we're going to touch base before that date. We definitely will. Yeah, we'll do a tech check, but we'll also do a. Um, we'll do a check tech check, but we'll also do a run through if you'd like to. Excellent. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It'll be that. For, it'll probably be that week. Uh, the week. So the night. The nineteenth will be um, Friday. So twenty twenty one. It'll probably be the week of the twenty first, twenty second, whatever that is. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much, okay, Susan. You're good. Out. Thank you, Sune. I really, yeah. really appreciate it. I hope to meet you in person soon. Of course. Thanks Bye, again. All right. Bye-bye. Really? Thank you. I love the presentation. It was wonderful. She's very sweet. She's really sweet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record this, but I'll cut off some of the bits of the beginning and the end, and then I'll just probably send it out as a link to everybody who came. And um, Susan, you're good for the meeting on Saturday, the board meeting. Okay, good. Well, okay, good. You guys have a great rest of the night and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.